From the good red earth comes iron ore, the basic element of steel. Can you imagine what would happen if a great magnet suddenly wrenched all steel from our daily life? What would happen to our skyscrapers? What would happen to our homes? What would become of our great bridges? How could we travel? How could we farm? How could we even communicate with one another? What would become of all industry? What indeed would become of all of us? Only in a nightmare could such a calamity occur. And so we begin the story of steel with huge shovels ripping the raw red iron ore from its ancient bed. 17 tons at a gulp is the capacity of this hungry giant eating into the bank of ore. A 34,000 pound load made possible by the strength and boundless capacity of steel. This is called the age of electricity. Is it not also the age of steel? It's an age of tremendous locomotive strength made possible and pressed into usefulness by steel. Lightweight, stronger railroad cars rolling over ribbons of steel. Open pit mining is restricted to months when frost is out of the ground. But the year around, we find the men of the underground mines, like gnomes, resting from nature or lying far beneath the earth's surface, contributing to the steady stream of loaded ore cars flowing between the iron ranges of the northwest and the northern harbors of the Great Lakes. Puffing impatiently, the ore boats of the Great Lakes fleet await their loads under ore bins at the docks. They must go. We must get this good red ore to the mills. So down comes the loading chutes, like the mouths of a huge prehistoric monster, to pour the ore into the belly of the waiting ore boat. Up goes the gate, and out pours the brown-red stream of the earth, which makes steel. Few things have less value than this raw iron ore, as we see it now. Yet there are few things of greater value and benefit to our modern civilization when the labor and intelligence of man is applied. These carriers must work fast during late spring, summer, and early fall. While the ice is out, scores of ships in this large lake fleet are constantly on the go. The loading completed, they start in an endless stream for the southern lake ports to feed the hungry blast furnaces of the steel mills to the south. Three days later, it's the end of the line and all hands on deck. There's no rest for an ore transport. Two or three hours in port and that's all. As men drive huge grab buckets like iron dragons, which snatch great bites of the ore stored in mountains of red earth, all ready for the blast furnaces. riding the cab of a clamshell bucket along an ore bridge as high as a six-story building. We see the ore picked up from a trough behind the unloaders by another clamshell and carried across the storage yards, traveling along a giant ore bridge just like the one we're on. Thousands upon thousands of tons of catalogued, registered and practically pedigreed ore pass beneath us. The ant has nothing on the steel business, for enough ore must be stored in summer to last through the winter when lake carriers are icebound. Steel skyline looms before us, a skyline made up of blast furnaces, tall sentinels of the steel plant which change the ore into molten iron. And here the cycle of steel making really begins. With the first step in the making of iron, an eight-ton skip hoist dumps into the blast furnace a rich mineral stew of ore, limestone and coke. We're getting up speed now. Down below on the casting floor, the stage is set. At intervals of six hours, the charge, smelted down under intense heat, is withdrawn. And here comes the signal to tap. Ready for their end of the job, these fellows stab an oxygen torch through the hole, piercing a plug of clay, and here it comes, a writhing stream of molten iron, 2,600 degrees hot. Between 150 and 250 tons are tapped in a cast. A hundred tons or so stream down runways of sand and graphite into the first of two huge ladles. Then the gate is raised and the molten stream flows to a second ladle. Outside lies the ladle, a thermos bottle as big as a tank car lined with brick capable of holding molten iron at the highest possible temperature. A lot goes on in the 20 minutes that it takes to make a cast. 
not so much in the six hours between casts. Then, there's time to relax. But now another sample must be taken from the golden screen, a test specimen, which will tell the steelmaker the quality of his work. He takes skilled men to nurse these monsters, men who know the whims of iron, men who've been feeding the pulse and taking the temperature of liquid metal for a good many years. It's possibly uncanny the way these fellas, with a single glance at their samples, recognize the caliber of the whole batch. And they seem pretty happy with this one. Now we have molten iron, the first step in the production of steel. This liquid iron goes for a while into huge storage tanks called mixers. We'll come back to this iron soup a little later, but first, the open hearth furnaces of steel. By far, the greatest amount of steel produced in the United States is made in open hearth furnaces such as these. The ravenous open hearth is never on a dike. It devours good scrap metal, odds and ends of antique flivers, and chunks of old rails, axles that may yet roll again, even chicken wire. And up on the charging machine, you see the operator handle a huge piece of machinery, so agile that it picks up an 8,000-pound charging box of scrap, thrusts it into the furnace, twists and turns and rams and charges at the touch of a hand upon a switch. And now back to that iron soup we left in the storage mixer a moment ago. As the work goes on, this molten metal is combined with the melted scrap. Perched high above, the crane man watches the ladle fill, then guides giant hooks in to carry the ladle down the line to the furnace. Meanwhile, an old hand at the game waits by the open hearth for the hot metal coming up from the mixer, ready to direct the crane man's pouring of the fiery charge into the blazing furnace. About 50 tons of liquid iron are now added to the melted scrap, and the sheer beauty of this scene never fails to grip the thousands who visit these plants. the making of steel was the experienced guesswork of smart old-timers. But today, their experience is backed up by the most accurate of scientific instruments. This is steel in the making. Throughout every stage of steel's vivid evolution, repeated tests are taken. The helper dips his test spoon, spoon, mind you, into the soup, and to the steel maker is just that, soup. And this sample, poured into a test mold, goes to the laboratory for analysis. These are the craftsmen of steel. These and hundreds of thousands like them, men born and raised to the companionship of hot metal, young men learning their trade, old men grown gray in the university of steel itself, men who know all the moods and fancies and quips and quirks of molten metal, who know how to tame and temper this flaming monster to the service of mankind. By their watches and their blue filter glasses shall ye know them. A golden glow on their faces, they peer into the open hearth to read the future of this steel as a gypsy reads your fortune in the tea leaves. Even as a great chef expertly adds just the right seasoning to his famous dishes, so these expert chefs of the open hearth add the condiments that season steel. In this case, a helping of ferromanganese. These boys certainly can handle their shovel. They swing and follow through with all the power and grace of a champion golf. They must hit a certain spot inside that furnace. And that, believe me, is quite an art. On the ranch or in a lumber camp, this means come and get it or we'll throw it away. It means grub. But in these mills, it means poor steel. Here are the cinder snappers, jacks of all trades. With ramming rod ready, they wait, while men on the other side prepare the furnace for tapping. 
another pinch of this and that from the bins and boxes according to the sure recipes of Steele's cookbook. Meanwhile, the helper with an oxygen torch burns through the clay which plugs the tapping hole. They're raring to go, these cinder snapper lads, but it takes time to uncork this glass. Just a moment now, only a few more ashes to get out of the way, and then the go-ahead will come. It's a welcome signal, because the smash of ramming through a heat of steel is always a highlight in their day's work. All together, there she goes. It's steel, backbone of the world, steel for axles, springs, girders, steel for bridges, wire, ships, automobiles, magic and marvels from the earth, from the labor and brains of men who serve their fellow men. It takes about 15 minutes to fill this ladle. Slag, the scum or flux of limestone, floats on top of the steel, finally overflowing into the slag pot. Bathed in a red glare, the crane man handles with ease his heavy load of glowing metal, this gigantic ladle like a huge soup bowl, 150 tons of liquid steel. Flames lick through the scum of its surface, a blood red touch from the seething cauldron. Stately as a ship, the ladle moves to its position at the pouring platform, ready at the mere touch of the hand to discharge into the waiting ingot mold. Skillfully, the crane man maneuvers the heavy load to rest, centering the nozzle above the first of the molds. The stopper is released and out gushes the steel to fill them one by one. Every little movement has a meaning of its own in steel. Tests for quality such as these are very important. They go to make steel one of the most scientifically controlled operations in all industry. Meanwhile, the fascinating work of pouring goes on. Here's a young apprentice in steel making, taking a lesson from the older heads of the pouring platform, as with an optical pyrometer, he measures the temperature of the molten steel. And we are seeing just what he sees through the pyrometer. Steel at 2,800 degrees hot. Slowly cooling, beautiful to look for. The ingots sparkle and effervesce in their mold. When cooled enough, they will be stripped of their most unfashionable jacket. Another day without an accident. It is now common for months to go by without a single man being injured. So highly developed is modern safety practice. One of the most thrilling operations of the whole dramatic story of steel making is the production of alloy steel in the electric furnace. Inside this hottest of all furnaces, huge electrodes suspended over the mass of selected scrap slowly creep down. An electric arc leaps from electrodes to scrap and produces one of the most spectacular sights ever filmed. Here is Inferno. three hours under this man-made lightning, the scrap is melted and the electrodes purr over the molten steel, now ready for the addition of alloys. Finally, the precious soup is cooked and out of the cauldron pours another heat of stainless steel. Steel for kitchens, for architectural trim, for fine instruments and for laboratories and hospitals, for use wherever a glossy acid and rust resisting surface contributes to modern industry and to modern living. Rising before you like a harvest moon is the hungry maw of a Bessemer converter, G-factor in one of the greatest shows in steel. 
closely watching this rising monster are the men who run the show, looking at life and steel from behind shatterproof glass, 30 feet away from the trio of Bessemer converters mounted on a high platform. The operator's whistle was the signal which brought the hot iron from the mixer and started it pouring into the mouth of the Bessemer converter. This iron whale, if really hungry, could swallow a score of Jonas at a gulf bar, could find room in its red-hot gullet for a good-sized motorboat. Every night is 4th of July when the Bessemers go into action, and here's your action. Roman candles lancing the blackness of the night. The girders of a railroad bridge march past, silhouetted by the licking flames of these beacons of steel. As many of you have often seen, these huge torches flare up in the dark as symbols of steel working for men. You are seeing it as the steel maker sees it, engaging the carbon content by the color of the flame. When the flame displays the telltale characteristics, the conversion is complete, and the Bessemers are ready to pour the magic metal, which first we saw as plain ore, then soft and molten iron, and now transformed to steel for all the needs of man. Here in the stripping yard is the row of jacketed ingots we left sparkling a moment ago and now cool enough to shed their molds. Reaching down, the human-like fingers of this Martian giant grasp and pry the molds from ingots weighing between 20 and 40,000 pounds. An impressive sight as the rich crimson velvety glow emerges from beneath the rising molds. Steel has no competitor in modern life, no possible substitute. Wherever you look, you will encounter examples of its service to man. The nation's parade of glowing ingots is a barometer of economic conditions and is watched by many who seek to gauge business activity. For as the ingots go, so goes industrial America. The golden pillars of fire go next to soaking pits for reheating, where they literally soak in a bath of flame which evenly restores their temperature. That was the signal to send one of these glowing ingots from the soaking pit. It is 2,200 degrees hot as you see it now. And we begin to get an idea of the innumerable processes required to make fine steel and how economical the finished product is after all this labor and effort. For after all, this is a hairpin, a thumbtack, a monkey wrench, a rail or a beam in infants. Through a mirror directly in front of him, the operator sees the ingot bumping along the conveyor rollers like a car on a corduroy road, unaware of the punishment to come as it will be squeezed, pounded and pressed into one of the thousand shapes which meet the demands of industry. The big idea here is to crack off the scale which is formed and to prepare the ingot for the real rough stuff to come. The ingot is manipulated from a pulp, protected by heavy screening and shatterproof glass, supported by the post partially hiding the ingot. The roller man glances at the dials and brings the roll down. It's a squeeze play, an inch or more of time until the huge ingot is flattened to a slab about five inches thick, ready to be cut like cheese into shorter lengths for further rolling. In the continuous rolling mill, skill workers in pulpits set high up across the floor from each set of rolls chart the course the slab must follow as they phone dimensions and adjustments from stand to stand. These continuous mills cover so much ground that the traffic lights of a mill are as important as the red and green stop and go lights of a small town. All clear, the rolls are set and ready, and here it comes, a white hot slab of steel sliding swiftly and smoothly toward the all-powerful roll. The first pass takes off the scale. 
Then a quarter turn on the turntable sends the slab sideways into the spreader to increase its width. An extra push is needed here to force it through the rolls. That's only the first step. Farther down the long line, the width is checked. And then the rapidly transforming slab of steel races on beneath showers of water and steam to enter the reversing mill. And back and forth and back and forth again it must pass. And this reducing process we don't recommend to the ladies. It's hard going for the slab, but it's just another dial setting and a turning of a switch to the man at the levers. He sits at a control board like the keyboard of an organ and casually watches the huge rolls do their work. Getting longer and longer, the plate races on to run the gauntlet of the finishing stands, four giant stands in tandem, each one squeezing the plate thinner and thinner. From the beginning of this pictorial drama of steel, we have seen how machines have been called the aid of the men who make steel. These machines of the steel mills are genii, more powerful, more incredible than Aladdin ever summoned by rubbing his wonderful lamp. Watch this servant work for man, his master. Machines obedient to the merest touch. Some as delicate as the flutter of a butterfly's wing. Some as powerful as an avalanche. These same machines, while producing amazingly low-cost steel, have created many new commodities, many new markets, thus providing for countless workers occupations which never existed before. One of the most interesting of recent inventions, the rocking shear, was suggested by an ordinary rocking chair, perfected in a wooden model which sheared chewing gum instead of steel. And now watch the result. Rocking power, high pressure shear, cutting cold steel plate with incredible ease and accuracy. Such is the story of steel today. Steel plate for use in railroad cars, steamships, bridges and buildings. Well, boys, you're doing a swell job and we're getting a real thrill watching you. Before going on, let's have a bottle of pop together. Drink hearty. Moving on in the production of steel, we come to the manufacture of sheet steel. Hot roll like steel plate, Sheet steel is merely rolled thinner and thinner, and then, cleaned with acids, it is coal rolled in coils to even lesser gauges, emerging on the other side of this machine as coal roll sheet for use in automobile fenders and bodies and stoves, refrigerators, and the many products of pressed steel. Further reduced and tin coated, coal rolled steel has thousands of uses as tin plate. Here's where the girls come in as inspectors of the finished plate. These shining services must tempt the vanity of any daughter of Eve, but surely not this girl. Uh-oh! Well, to err is human. It must have been the oversized mirror that did it. With that little touch of feminine vanity satisfied, she goes back to her work, an artist at her job. These girls are mighty useful employees in a tin plate mill, and their schedule is arranged accordingly. An hour on and 15 minutes off for coffee, tea, and rest. Here we are back again with hot steel. And there's a red hot rail coming through the first pass, taking on his first big impression. Like everything else in steel, this rail was rolled down from an engine. The rail bar takes more definite shape with each new pass through the rolls. After the first pass, it moves down to the end of the line across the conveyor table, and up on the high line in the middle to an intermediate pass, and then across another conveyor table, and down the line at the right to the finishing rolls for its final impression, the finished rail over which the wheels of your train may someday click. Steel cuts steel, the cold biting through the hot, sawing a rail bar of more than 100 feet long into standard lengths. We go along now to still another most interesting episode in the fascinating drama of steel production. To still another pictorial chapter in the saga of steel, rolling giant beams. How many people would ever guess that from this six foot ingot, a 36 inch high beam, almost as long as a city block, could be rolled. Hot rolls steam and sizzle, while an operator skillfully trips the switches controlling a pressure of many thousands of pounds. Back and forth under the dripping rolls, the ingot passes until it takes on a faint shape, the semblance of an eye beam. 
suggestion of a girder that may support a bridge or a skyscraper. It's all as easy as falling off a log, or so it seems, as this young man of steel handles the controls, passing the huge form backward and forward, reducing the gauge, shaping the rough beam into an almost finished product, and sending it along down the line on its way to the finishing stand. There comes the I-beam out of the finishing stand, and we have actually seen how 150 feet of strong, sturdy steel can be rolled from a six-foot inch, the columns and girders with which America builds its future. The beam slides down the rollers, coming to a stop at the saw to be trimmed and cut to length. mighty particular to get things right, these steel men. Here, they're taking a sample from the hot beam, a test piece, which will go on to the laboratory. But right now, they have another use for it. The hot beam sample performs a dual role, serving also as a fireless cooker deluxe for Mike's private coffee pot. It's too good a thing to keep to himself, so big-hearted Mike calls powerful Pat to have a sip of the old Java with him. I accept with thanks, Sissy, but don't ever let the wife know you're this good, or she'll be after pinning an apron on you. Now let's stroll over to the axle forge where immense hammers are pounding like pile drivers. This machine does the heavy work, but man's hand shapes the railroad axle. Packing an awful wallop, this hammer slams down on the helpless round, beating it into shape. crews alternate at the hammer as each axle is turned. Now the axle is forged from the other end as the giant hammer shapes the collar. See between the hammer blows the alert, intense faces of these men. While the axle is getting its finishing touches, railroad wheels are being turned out in another impressive operation of the modern steel plant. The first thing which will catch your eye will be a red-hot wheel block, as the steel men call it, about to take its place between the two halves of a wheel mold. And then as men and machinery take advantage of the precise moment, the blowing hot block is formed under 20 million pounds of pressure, slowly, very slowly pressed and flattened and shaped into a blank, something close to a railroad wheel, but not yet the real article. And then with scarce an instant's pause, the blank is lifted from mold number one, while mold number two slides slowly and easily to the left and relentlessly grips the victim between its powerful jaws. And then comes the final shaping in the finishing mold under further terrific pressure. If you thought the first one was a squeezer, watch number two. The throttle of Casey Jones never controlled as much power as these levers, which now release the rough wheel and send it on to the caliper man. Only perfection gets by this chap. Then upon emerging, the wheel is ready for finishing, perhaps to convey you someday, possibly soon, on a journey of your heart's desire. Here's another chapter in the tale of steel. Coming out of a reheating furnace is a pair of billets, 30 foot lengths of steel, about two inches square. They too were rolled down from an ingot, rolled in a billet mill, much like a rail mill. The billets, 
run the gamut of 16 sets of reducing rolls. Each roll reduces the diameter and hastens the rod with ever increasing speed toward its final reduction. In a moment, you'll see it begin to step out, the snail turning into a scared rabbit. Its rate of speed through the rolls will jump from four to 45 miles an hour, better than a racehorse, as its length increases from 30 feet to almost three quarters of a mile. These close shots show exactly what takes place. Slow at the start, then faster in this intermediate pass, and still its speed increases. If you watch closely, you can see it dart through these rolls. And at last, there it comes, whistling into the coiler, to be tamed into a shapely coil of finished rod. These marvelous machines of steel pull their own taffy, heavy wire from rod as we see here in these big dies. But we're not through yet with this metallic candy pulling. Now the rapidly thinning wire goes to a huge drum, which is a real taffy puller, and our wire gets tenuous and more tenuous. The operator most accurately measures the gauge. For a thousandth of an inch, counts in the kind of accuracy that is standard in wire drawing. The rest of the story of wire making is one reduction after another a hundredth or a thousandth of an inch at a time. Finer and finer, the tough steel wire is drawn. On the wire goes darting, twisting, weaving to and fro, through as many as 11 dies, until finally it comes out all bright and silvery, almost as fine as silk and thread. And so wire is made for countless demands, for bed springs, nails, fence, telephone and telegraph lines, more than 90,000 uses represented in our modern civilization. Production of pipe and tubes is another important phase of steel making. The finest kind of tube is seamless. Starting as a hot round, a reheated cylinder of solid steel is hustled along and rammed into the seamless piercing mill. By means of great pressure, created by whirling cone-shaped rolls forcing the malleable steel forward over a piercing point, the round emerges on the other side as a seamless tube, a hollow pipe of hot rolled steel. It's remarkable how perfectly this round of golden hot steel is pierced, expanded, and finished to meet specification. One of the most interesting operations to be found in any of these great steel mills. And so, mile after mile of seamless tube finds its place in the pipeline for service for heat, fuel, water, and the other necessaries of modern life. Let's turn from the colorful, dramatic sight of the mill to the quiet of the laboratories and to the scientists. Much of what you've seen would not have been possible without the research men constantly working into the future of steel and devising new ways for it to serve its master, man. Here we see steel's anatomy photographed and studied. Here's a piece of Corten steel getting the tensile test. That dark colored piece the metallurgist has just placed in the machine is being subjected to the severest possible tension. See how remarkably a piece of steel can be stretched, almost like rubber. 50, 60, 70,000 pounds of pull per square inch and more to find the breaking point. It's amazing that steel can stand such punishment. Finally, it does break under much greater strain than ever will be exacted in its actual use. With little furnaces such as these, the scientists work with patient study and experiment to develop stainless steel whose shining surface reflects the research and the effort devoted to its production. This is the fascinating world of steel. Many are those who walk its paths. The miner, the engineer, the crane man, the melter, the roller, the scientist, hundreds of thousands among the men of steel. More than 500,000 men are engaged in making steel, over half of them in the companies of the United States Steel alone. Men who are confident and competent in their work. Men who can return to their homes and firesides proud and happy in the knowledge of their contribution to society. Beyond the door of a furnace, we see nothing but hot gases and bubbling metal. But the man who makes steel sees there streamlined trains streaking smoothly across the continent. Great ships carrying the products of the farm and factory to the four corners of the earth. 
sailing the seven seas with the promise of world peace through world trade, with commerce and profit to all. He sees concrete roads made from the slag of blast furnaces, busy with cars and trucks of steel. He sees beyond that bubbling steel the wire lines of modern telephone and telegraphic communication, and the high towers carrying electric power to home and industry. He sees modern farming made possible by steel machinery and fencing. Countless oil derricks stretching their structures to the heavens, gaunt frameworks of steel, landmarks of another of America's great industries. Big and little things he sees, the big little conveniences of modern cookery, stainless steel utensils and kitchen sinks. Hammers and little nails that play a big part or the melodious vibration of a finely drawn steel piano string. He sees acid-resisting cans for food preservation or a fine steel watch spring set in a steel chassis. And he sees tall buildings of steel rearing their proud heads almost above the clouds. Great bridges spanning rivers and harbors, bringing commerce and its people closer and closer together. All these and more the man of steel sees. New eras, new standards of living, as the world moves forward with the men who make steel.